why why editing? What drew you to exploring this art form? Yeah, um, well, you know, the film craft series, uh, which um, was devoted to different cinematic disciplines, uh, the editor of the series uh, essentially asked me to do the editing one. So that's kind of the short answer for why, what drew me to it. Um, uh, I would say, though, that of, um, of all the disciplines, uh, editing was the one that really appealed to me the most, in part because I think it's the most elusive of, of, mm. of, the, of the disciplines. And it, it, it struck me as actually a very difficult and conceivably challenging thing to write about in, in a way that kind of excited me. I, I, I mean, um, not that I wouldn't have also been interested to write about cinematography or direction or production design, but editing, which is kind of like, you know, obviously it's it's the very sort of language of the film and the very construction of the film. And, and so, and when you evaluate editing, you're obviously looking at something it's almost like looking at something invisible, you know, kind of mm-hmm. in between the frames. And so it's, it, it's, uh, I say this to say it was, it was a challenging thing. I didn't know that I could do it, but it was the, it was um, perhaps the, uh, I, I would also say it's probably the, the, um, the aspect of filmmaking that I perhaps most readily identify with as sort of a writer and editor myself, you know, even though obviously editing writing is very different from editing film, but I certainly found that when I was writing the book and kind of um, in the book of interviews um, of, uh, you know, with 17 of um, the world's top film editors uh, arranged in, in a, in a, in a, in a way. So it's like a first person account. And so, or even just the work of doing that was very much, I, I was sort of doing, I think what an editor, what a film editor does, which is mm-hmm. finding the best parts, isolating the best parts, arranging them into a shape that is, you know, compelling and, and, and coherent and, and makes sense and is hopefully engaging. So, um, so all of this, so yeah, it, it was certainly represented a very different, um, kind of writing, um, from my work at Variety. Um, and, and thank you for your kind words. It's really, it's, I, I always feel that, felt that like, um, it, it would be a good experience for a critic to actually know something about filmmaking. So I thought this would Absolutely. be a good exercise. It, it's, yeah. it's a gorgeous book. I mean, it's a valuable book for, Anyone that loves film, they don't have to be tech nerds or, or want to go into the film no. themselves. But I mean, it's a film lover's book. What interests me, though, about what you're saying uh, about relating to it from a writer's standpoint mm-hmm. is it's often said about film editing that it is the final rewrite. Correct, yeah. And that was a theme and an idea that really echoed throughout um, all the interviews that I did, uh, you know, I, I think particularly of uh, Stephen Marioni, who, of course, is uh, among his films, he's edited like Traffic and Babel and 21 Grams and to work with Steven Soderbergh. And he, I remember very vividly, he said that he was drawn to it primarily because he had an interest in storytelling. Um, and, and that was an interesting idea because you think, you know, oh, well, then the, the storyteller, well, that's, that's the writer or the director. And, and of course, that's true. But um but the editors, almost all the editors I spoke with see themselves as crucial um, to the, the storytelling process in a way that not necessarily every participant on a film production is. And it wasn't a self-important idea like that they had a, they had a, a high, an inflated opinion of themselves, not at all. It's just when the editor, you know, at the post-production, you're literally at the, the very end of the um uh, of of the funnel, as it were. So you're at the end of the the assembly line, I guess. And so, um, and and they are collaborating so very closely with the director. So absolutely, what you said is true. That they are the final rewrite or the final write, even on a script. You know, because they they determine uh, what gets in and <laughs> what doesn't. So um, well, we've we've talked to editors in the past on the show. I mean, just last week we had. Uh, Carol Littleton on on the program, um, mm-hmm. and it's absolutely correct what you say that it's an elusive art. Did you find that even amongst the people you interviewed, the ones that make their livelihood in this field, that they had difficulty articulating what they do? Some of them did, and I think I mean the people that I chose. I'm fortunate to have you know found 17 people who are not only uh, superb practitioners of their craft, but also um, are pretty good at talking about it. That said, I think at one point in each interview, every person, every editor was sort of stumped by a question, so I had to really think about it because it, it is certainly a difficult thing to put 
into words and um not everyone is Walter Murch you know who is kind of mm. the the god the godfather of you know uh, so to speak <laughs> since he edited the godfather but he's sort of the godfather of film editing and the the person who has done the most gone further than anyone i think to help us understand um and put into concrete analytical language um what editing is all about. Not everyone is certainly like Walter Merchant and certainly uh, editors like uh, Anne V. Coates, who won an Oscar for Lawrence of Arabia, and Michael Kahn, who is Steven Spielberg's editor and who has just his two films coming to theaters now with Tintin and War Horse. Um, yeah. uh, it's, uh, they both kind of said, like, I'm not Walter Merch, but it, I can't explain how I do what I do. I just cut the way I feel. And it's a very yeah. emotional thing. It's a very emotional medium, a very emotional um, discipline, and it's it's in, and um, one of the more interesting things that I that that recurred throughout was um, editors would tell me that the most difficult scene to cut is not what you'd think like a, a real an action scene or a really you know a, a really you know a, a scene with, you know, whether it's a car chase or, or a gunfight or something. They said the hardest, most challenging scenes are dialogue scenes, really kind of concentrated dramatic dialogue scenes where they have to find the best pieces of an actor's performance. And, mm. and, and that, that was just a really a, 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 a kind of a constant throughout. And, and because obviously your, your, your attention is actually kind of heightened in scenes like that. And, and I think um, inauthenticity and artifice are easier to detect in situations like that. You know? so, so in that respect, it's, it's, they, they all find that sometimes the most challenging or the most satisfying scenes that they edited were, um, were dialogue as opposed to action. Did you find that generally each of these editors they chose to cut according to performance outside of any other criteria? Performance is a really is, is probably the one. Uh, it's really important. Um and uh <clears throat> I mean certainly there are other Aspects. I mean, it was one of the interesting things with Envy Coates when she was cutting Lawrence of Arabia, and I would just, you know, when you think of that film, you just think of those beautiful landscapes, you know, in the desert. You know, that's kind of the first image that you might get. But she kind of focused on the performances and on Peter O'Toole, and she said, like, yeah, when I, when I could find, a, you know, a, 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 a nice, you know, scenery shot, sure, I'd cut there, I'd cut that in. But in a way, it was like, but it really kind of had to having to maintain kind of the. Um, the human touch, I suppose, uh, is the way to put it. So um, that is a huge, and and of course, um, you know, Merch, who who was just such a, I, it was an incredibly inter intimidating interview. Uh, I must say to talk to him, <laughs> but uh, just, you're talking to someone who who's a uh, master, yeah. a, a master who knows more, who has more knowledge of this stuff in his little finger than than you could ever hope to amass in a lifetime. And it's just, but he was, you know, he was he was incredibly generous. Uh, with his knowledge and his insights, but um, he, of course, has a very kind of evolved hierarchy of what you cut for, you know. And I think, um, and you know, it, and of course, there are all these these things that are you know very important, whether it's like the the eye line matches or kind of the you know are you on the right side of the frame, you know, all, all this all the very kind of technical stuff. But he says, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the most important rule is the emotional content of the scene, and if cut is emotionally true if it best serves the emotional uh impact of the scene then that overrides every other rule it doesn't matter if it's you know not in the right place or if there it violates the, the 180 degree line i mean ideally you would take all these things into consideration and find the perfect cut that satisfies all those criteria but that sometimes doesn't exist because you have to work with with the coverage you're given right you know what amazes me about editing <clears throat> part of what amazes me about it is the fact that they're they're Working with millions of frames, uh, mm. they're dissecting, uh, recutting, re reconfiguring scenes. Yeah. Did any of them speak to uh, how the importance of getting kind of a distance from it, so they can they can view it ob objectively somehow in that process? Yes, certainly. I mean, um, <clears throat> I don't want to keep quoting Merch, but he he did uh, speak to that. Um, just the importance of for him, um, he finds it extremely important to <clears throat> maintain a certain detachment from what's going on on the set. He sees himself and he sees the editor's role as that of an audience surrogate. So he wants to experience the material fresh in the dailies. He doesn't want to see 
the director setting up the shot. He doesn't want to see the script beforehand. He doesn't want to walk on the set. He doesn't want to meet the actors. He wants as pure a first um, a first contact with the footage as possible because that's the only way he thinks that he can truly get the audience's reaction. Um, and that said, I, and then I spoke with um, someone who has a very different approach, who is uh, William Chang, who is um, probably the best-known editor and production designer based in Hong Kong. Um, and he's very unusual. He's, a, he's not just an editor, but he's a production designer. And so he, of course, is very heavily involved in the production. And, and so he sees no problem with kind of um, being on set and kind of seeing how, you know, having no distance from the material, as it were. Hmm. So uh, two very different approaches, two, you know, wonderful editors um, who are, who I don't think could be any more different in their methods or their or the, kind of the, the styles of the films that they've that they've edited collectively, but uh, I, I was certainly trying to get as as wide a range of um, of editors as I could, and and kind of you know show the show the reader different styles of not just film editing but but filmmaking, hopefully. Well, you, you have a you have many examples of some of my favorite. <clears throat> Uh, films and, and sequences in here, uh, in terms of editing, and uh, and it, none none more haunting than for me than The Godfather Two, and how it kind of splices back and forth through time and makes those connections feel so visceral. Um, tell tell me what you learned about the process. That was a long process to get that balance correct on that project wasn't it yeah yeah definitely i'm glad you bring that up that was i mean uh it was very it was it was just great to get to talk to uh richard marx who was one of i believe three editors uh who worked mm. on the godfather part two back in those days especially with coppola's films apocalypse now is another great example um they had they employed many editors on a film and and which is sometimes still the case uh nowadays but uh, i think back then it was just such a certainly it was such a physical editing was such a physically laborious uh, process that it was often uh, required, um, and and yeah, with with The Godfather Two, I mean, it, just to give you a sense, I mean, those those beautiful dissolves, which I remember just kind of transfixing me when I saw the film, you know, as a as a you know younger younger moviegoer. Um, it, it, what we take for granted now, I mean, now you can kind of pull off an effect like that dissolving between the past and the present. Um, and of course, I don't know, for the benefit of listeners, um, not everyone knows what a dissolve is. That's a kind of a, a fade in between frames so that the, the, the one, one, one scene kind of melts into another as opposed to a direct cut. Um, and, and it's a very, nowadays, you can, you know, on, on an app, you can do that pretty much in seconds and you can undo it in seconds if you don't like it. Um, and, but back then, you had to, um, you had to, do do an optical. You had to send it to a lab. You had to you know you had to mark the dissolve on the on the, on the film. And I, I'm, I'm speaking to it's a very it, the 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 technical uh, aspect of the process kind of you know still I I don't know that I know much more about film editing now than when I started on a technical <laughs> level. I will say that I, I certainly learned a lot, but I don't. But I, I certainly am no no better at. Uh, you could not have me actually edit a film myself um, in any way, but. Um, but with uh but it was just there was back back then with Richard Marx telling me about those dissolves, there were so many things that could go wrong. You could ruin the negative, you could it would you could play it and the dissolve you know, it just it was just fat it's just we take so much for granted now, technology, you know, um technology wise. And what's uh one of the more uh kind of constant themes in the book too was um just the the changes that have that that has wrought in, in, yeah. in the art form and with uh you know, editing on film now is kind of um, kind of obsolete. I mean, the, who I, Michael Kahn, who I mentioned, this, this was the first, these two films, uh, War Horse and Tintin, were the first films that he ever cut on um, on the Avid, digitally, as opposed to, because he was a stickler for the Moviola, and, um, and mm. Spielberg is a, is a stickler for for, for um, kind of like vintage uh, filmmaking technology. So um, many, most editors have long since converted, and, and you know, and that, and uh, there were very mixed feelings, I would say, throughout. I mean, every, throughout everyone I talked to kind of conceded it's necessary, it's helpful, it's an improvement in many ways. But there is something lost with that too. You don't get as much time to um, to kind of sit and think about what you're cutting and having and, yeah. and having a strategy, having a strategy, a, a pre thought out strategy beforehand. I find I would think that that's probably 
been something that uh, artists along all uh, fields had have to grapple with. I mean, in, just in terms of cinematography yeah. and the three D and the digital argument and Absolutely. the editing with the Avid. And, so, how how did Michael Kahn take to the Avid? Well, yeah, well, you know, it's uh, it's funny. He he kind of you know Michael Kahn, who is the most kind of um, just uh, the most gracious and kind of hilarious people I've in, I interviewed for the book. Um, he he just and and for someone who is um, uh, won more Oscars for film editing than any other editor. He is astoundingly humble and thinks that mm-hmm. I, I can't believe he has the attitude. I can't believe that what I do, people think is any good. I'm just, this is all a, a, kind of an accident. <laughs> and, um, mm-hmm. and he, you know, it's, but he kind of brushes it off like, yeah, it's, it's no big deal. Cutting on the Avid. It's a, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a tool just like anything else, you know, and um, a tool can be very useful to you and can make you, um, much more efficient. A tool can also uh, make you way more inefficient if you procrastinate with it and don't entirely know what you're doing. Is kind of his, the attitude of not just him, but most of most of the people that I spoke with. So, um, and I think he's still. You know, they, they haven't completely laid to rest the idea of um, of you know cutting on film. I mean, I think uh, in this case, certainly with Tintin, with the, the amount of just uh, of CGI with that film, it would have been kind of not very feasible to cut it in any other way. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, no, and a lot of, you know, a lot of my, the editors I spoke with have, have used a, a, a range of tools in, in their time. And um, just to kind of keep, go the other end of the spectrum, um, probably the, the most uh, cutting edge, so to speak, uh, editors that I spoke with were um, uh, Angus Wall and Kirk Baxter, who uh, mm-hmm. this past year won an Oscar for the social network. They work with David Fincher and um and they are just and, and david fincher who is kind of the, one of the 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 at the forefront of kind of the the complete i would say digitization of the filmmaking process where um just using uh you know shooting on hd and um and and employing you know a, a lot of visual effects but not for not for visual effects sake but actually to enhance kind of the realism and the artfulness of the film and um and uh so perk and angus they were um they're uh they are at the fore of that and um they spoke with me about cutting social network and also their their new film the girl with the dragon tattoo and um and th- it's there's a very modern style i would say they right. they um they they there's marked by uh very rapid cutting but quicker cutting than you would have uh perhaps seen in kind of um you know in, in the 60s or 70s um because the audience uh the audience can um, is used to that now, and the audience not, is expect expects that. And I think um, even editors like Walter Murch, uh, uh, Michael Kahn, Richie Marks, these these guys, they know that too. I mean, in some ways, they're they're not necessarily you know sticklers for the way things used to be. They're they're one of their ability their ability to remain relevant and to continue to work mm-hmm. with the top filmmakers is is a product of their knowing what uh, that everything changes and everything evolves and one thing is not necessarily better or worse than the other. It's how you approach it. And, um, kind yeah, of and, I, it. and I do think that uh, experimentation, and, it, and maybe this is one of the benefits of working digitally as well, uh, it, it can be a great benefit. And, and I was very thankful that you included, I, I believe it's Ann Coates, uh, yes. un, yeah. the scene from Unfaithful, where she yeah. described that they, they tried to play it linear, linearly, uh, mm-hmm. In a linear fashion, I can't say yeah. that word. No, uh, the love, <laughs> the love scene. Guess, yeah. yeah, yeah, the love yeah. scene followed by her on the train, and somehow it just worked m- best intercut mm-hmm. between those two moments. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's a fascinating scene. That's just a such an effective scene. It's such an effective scene. I think it's. I, I do think it's the best scene in the movie, and the scene you you kind of think of when you think of unfaithful. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, just to go back to your earlier point, it's, it's a scene that's very much built around performance. You know, um, in yeah. fact, uh, when uh, Andy Coates talked to me, she said that yeah, it's just it was just such an interesting insight into how um, something that we take for granted. You would you would think that oh, it was it was it was written that way and it was directed that way, but no, in fact, it was um, the uh, an editor's kind of stroke of genius to to do that, and um, and in that. In that way, it's 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 kind of a lesson to directors, you know, let your editors kind of uh, play around a little bit, you know, um, because they can they can surprise you and they can find they can find the key. And I remember Anne telling me that, yeah, I mean, 
as as it's as brilliant as Diane Lane's performance was in that movie, um, and she was brilliant. You know, it's uh, it's the performance wasn't working in that scene at least. You know, and she had to find a way around it because the the pieces just weren't clicking together. You know, and and a lot of editors told me this too, like uh, Dylan Titchener, who edited um, like Magnolia, Boogie Nights. Telling me sometimes you can get a performance that feels like a Frankenstein, you know, because because yeah. actors can go there's there's a whole you know gamut of emotions that can go they can go very you know from zero to to ten or to hundred you know, and so their performance kind of can run an entire spectrum of emotional registers, and so if you take one from register seven and one from register two, well those might not fit together very well, and so um, so it's 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 funny so. So actors, I would say, you know, and I think the ones who really know would would probably be say that, yeah, who's editing the film is it's really important, you know. The yeah. cinematographer is important because they light you and make you look attractive, but the editors are, uh, you know, important in terms of um, in terms of making a performance that shaping a performance that feels true. And um, right. that was certainly certainly important in Unfaithful, where they in the end they had to kind of you know, insert this kind of flashback structure in order to, which, you know, which enabled the scene to play on, on a more kind of suspenseful level and, and also kind of, you know, glossed over some of the issues that were, that were, that she was having with that film. So yeah. I'm wondering about the philosophy of edit, of editing uh, mm-hmm. in terms of it being known as an invisible art the, you know they some people say you you know you're watching a very well edited movie when you don't notice the editing where you're just carried along <laughs> the story but then you yeah. walk out of a film like uh, like a I, I just for an example like a JFK and yeah. that's all you can Absolutely. talk about i mean just yeah. that amazing editing i mean what what mm-hmm. what where do you fall in this and where do your subjects where fall? do i fall yeah that's a great i mean the subjects fall all over the map i mean i think the kind of the one who gives voice most uh, firmly to the one to the the view you just uh the the, the editor who is um kind of a stickler for the classical hollywood style you know you don't you're not conscious of the editing it all serves the story would be um an, someone like Joel Cox who's interviewed in the book and who's works with Clint Eastwood who is kind of just the master of sort of um no frills filmmaking and no frills right. in the sense that you aren't you know the 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 you're not supposed to take notice of the filmmaking and then you have you have you know a Jean-Luc Godard film which you know completely upends up that that entire way and the, the, the where kind of the genius of it lies entirely in letting the audience know we know that you know you're watching a movie so mm-hmm. um and and that you know and then knowing that is not um is not a detriment to the experience and so um i you know i, I as as a critic you know with as, who tries to cultivate kind of as as broad a taste as I can, I, I certainly don't subscribe to either school. I would say in recent years, you know, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to, to speak with William Chang is because I'm such a fan of Wong Kar Wai's movies. Yeah. And a movie like a movie like In the Mood for Love, which is just one of the most gorgeous movies ever made, and it, it's completely, there's that, you know, it's it's very nonlinear. It's completely weaving in and out of, it. it, it, it it's this beautiful kind of expressionist uh thing where um you're not really following a seamless story it's it's like a movie that's like it's like a series of ruptures throughout you know so it's yeah. nothing but it's it, seamlessness is not even in the question and, and um or even you know a, a different film like um like 21 grams which uh Stephen Marioni was telling me about where he was editing it almost too coherently for the director's taste the director um Alejandro Gonzalez Iñárritu um said you're you're doing this too clean. You're 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 employing too many of the tricks. You know you're 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 doing too good a job. I want this movie to be messy and ragged and raw. And I want it to be broken and shattered in a million pieces. You know, mm. and I want individual scenes to be just you know, kind of, you know, really really you know, almost hard not hard to follow. But you know he didn't he wanted kind of a, a very frayed edges kind of filmmaking. You know, right. so um, it, it truly there is no right answer to these things. It's all about the style of the film. And you know the, the the story and the kind of um, the visual and the emotional and the narrative effect that you're trying to achieve. Um, and and one thing that the editors certainly what Envy Coates said among others is that they they don't think they largely don't think that they themselves should have their own style. The style should be whatever the style of the film is, and that can change. That should change from film to film. So so in that respect, perhaps the editor is sort of 
supposed to remain invisible and that he's not he or she is not supposed to have a visible imprint the way you know the way an auteur does so um that's interesting you know. uh that that's an interesting notion because you you think of of directors and writers and cinematographers having their own kind of unique styles uh with editors right. are there is there a risk of typecasting among editors <laughs> yeah you know uh it's it's a great question i mean um i think uh and, and it's funny because when I was even kind of looking over the choices that I had, I, I was sort of gravitating toward editors who had, you know, who had a had had a longstanding collaboration with the director, such as, mm-hmm. um, you know, Walter Murch with with Coppola or uh, Stephen Marioni with uh, Ian Ari too, or with Steven Soderbergh. And and in that, you know, certainly you almost look at like Marioni is a great example because. He edited Babel. He edited Twenty One Grams and Traffic. So you think, oh, his shtick is, you know, um, these movies with these sprawling narratives that are jumping around in time and geography, you know. Um, and so that's what he does. And that's and certainly it would be a mistake to to think that that's all he could do because he also edited um, the sort of much more relaxed uh, Good Night and Good Luck, you know, or um, you know, and it's and. Um, he would, and it's funny too, because he would say that you know the things that you identify as editing in that movie, which is kind of the the, the cutting randomly all around and the, the multiple storylines, that's actually more a function of the script than the editing. You know, it's like mm-hmm. so. Stephen Marioni is not deciding what scene comes next. You know, he is that that is dictated by, by a, a generally very fixed and rigorous script uh, or, or scene order, and so. Um, so I, it would be in some in that respect it's, it perhaps is a kind of typecasting, but it would be a, a mistake to 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 think that. And um, and just uh, another example too is someone like um, Christopher Rouse, who is um, who edits uh, Paul Greengrass's film. So he's done um, the last two Born movies and United ninety three. You know, yeah. all of which are done in this sort of very jagged, very kinetic, like a hyper hyper kinetic. Um, you know, kind of almost sort of docu drama, sort of pulls from documentary. Very, very, you know, it's it's become a it's become a very common thing now. You know, of course, and, and Rouse is someone who's who's really kind of pioneered that style. But you know, he also had, you know he edited a movie like Eight Below, which is the the, the movie about the um, the dogs, and so it's like which is a much very a very different kind of film, and one that he says he had no, you know, I mean. Uh, that film isn't the first one that comes to mind, perhaps, when you're thinking about his body of work. But he says that was just as kind of meaningful and interesting a project as as his more um, the sort of more demonstrative, um, I guess, is, yeah. is one, yeah. one way to say it. Uh, films that he's edited with Greengrass. So, how, how do they normally like to work with the director? Because uh, you know, I hear about Scorsese working with 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 Thelma Schumacher and. Yes. And he's sleeping in the editing bay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, do, do they do they all require that close communication with the director? Right, right. And and that the editor director relationship is something that is really something I definitely wanted to include. You know, anecdotally, um, you know, give the reader some sense of. And I would say no one was kind of more more candid or more hilarious on the subject than. Um, the, uh, this Icelandic editor that I spoke with, Valdis Oscars Dottir, who um, whose name I know will, is not a ha- household name over here in the States, but who's, you know, she edited Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and and um, and among among many other films. That's probably her most um, salient Hollywood credit. But um, but she she's she's a, not only a brilliant editor, but she's a very strong personality, and she made she was very upfront in that kind of very bracingly direct. You know, no nonsense European way. <laughs> like I, I have nothing against the director being in the room so long as he keeps quiet while I'm working. And she proceeded <laughs> to tell, she proceeded to tell me a story. You know, one, one story after another about all the directors that she has clashed with, and <laughs> naming names, and you know, and and you know, saying that because they just wouldn't shut up and they wouldn't leave me alone and they would interfere <laughs> and they would tell me how to do my job and I can't work like this. You know, and so. It was real. I was startled at how candid she was, <laughs> and so that's kind of an example. And, and eventually, she found a way to make it work. But you know that that relationship, yeah, certainly can be very abrasive. And um, she told me then she edited uh, Finding Forrester, and she told me what a 
what a refreshing change it was to work with Gu- uh, Gus Van Sant, who would just kind of sit in the editing room, kind of playing his guitar and typing on his computer and just kind of, you know, every so often kind of offering a comment if, if she wanted one and just kind of let her be, you know. So that was one example, you know, and she's kind of an extreme example of someone who kind of prizes, uh, you know, very much values having control. And others who, you know, like Tim Squires with Ang Lee, who kind of, you know, works in a very, they have a very kind of effortless sort of give and take, and, you know, he'll cut a few sequences and show it to him, and what does he think, and then, um, and, you know, so it, it very much varies. Um, I know, you know, someone that you mentioned, like uh, Thelma Schumacher and um, and Martin Scorsese, who've been just working together for years, it's like they're 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 very much in sync with each other, you know, and they, yeah. they've they've sort of, uh, evolved a, a very, a very easy kind of um, relationship and, and collaboration. In terms of uh, test screenings, do they do they find those valuable? Lee Smith, who edited um, Inception and um, The Prestige and The Dark Knight, he's, he he works with Christopher Nolan, of course. Um, spoke a lot about the, the the test screening process and it's funny because as a critic my I am hardwired to scoff at the idea of test screenings you know because mm-hmm. which I think are sort of like a way to how can we make this film pander more to the audience but um right. but in but which is you know I mean and there's something to that but at the same time it's like one of the uh, writing the book was certainly an education sort of the practical realities of the business which is that an audience can tell you if something is working or not. Certainly, if it's a comedy or an action film, um, you know, the, it's it's kind of just a part of the process that uh, that every editor kind of has to make peace with or or not in in their own way. And so, with um, Lee Smith was telling me about when he was editing uh, the Truman Show, working with Peter Weir, who you know, like him, is um, fellow um, Australian. Um, they that they test they apparently had. Uh, I would say like you know as many as fourteen different versions of the Truman Show at any at, you know throughout over the course of the process. I don't know if they test screened every single one, but that was you know they they certainly screened it and watched it and and so that movie had so many different forms and at one point was in a, in a form that's probably just unrecognizable from what the finished product was. So um, and that that was sometimes just really you know a film can take a very sometimes a film can take a very long time to sort of discover itself in, in the editing room. So. Um, and you know someone like uh oh sorry yeah you were no 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 yeah. no no I yeah. mean it's it, it is fascinating because it, there are also accounts in your book of you know the first cut of this movie was four and a half hours and we had to take an hour and forty five minutes out of it right. and what what right. an incredibly daunting <laughs> I oh yes wow uh, someone who you know it's it's sort of like but you you know you have a two thousand word piece and you have to get it down to a thousand and only only I think harder too you know and it's like yeah. how do you you know, I mean, I remember for sure, I mean, I think, you know, with you know, something like The English Patient, you know, getting that down from, you know, from probably around you know, around four hours to something, you know, more more commercial, I suppose, or not, not just more commercial, but also just, you know, more um, probably just the way the the the, the, the length more palatable, yeah. more palatable, absolutely, and um, you know, I, I'm thinking too about. Uh, what am I thinking about? Sorry. Um, there was another example that's eluding me right now. Um, but uh, that's, yeah, it's it's always a very difficult thing. And how do you trim? Oh, yes, I remember um, with uh, Angus and Kirk talking about, you know, something like The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, where um, they had to kind of, you know, it, it was, you know, Early on, they knew it was running too long, so they so I think it was Kirk Baxter who made um, who made a few little snips here and there, and well, you know shave a bit off here and there. And then David Fincher said, uh, "You haven't even started yet." <laughs> he said, "Like and like rip open the scene, and you know get to, you know you know pull take you know roll up your sleeves and you know actually cut cut the film." So mm-hmm. um, and it's hard. You you end up losing some really great stuff, and and and. Um, and one of the things the editor said too is, is one of the heartbreaking things, but also one of the necessary things is knowing um, knowing when a scene can be really, really great, can really sing, and knowing that the right thing to do is to cut it anyway. You know, it's yeah. sort of almost a mark of a mark of an editor's maturity, and um, it is just knowing when is right. It's right to to remove something 
um, that that is that is a good thing and that a lot of people worked on, but that is ultimately not serving the larger vision. Is not serving the film as a whole. Is distracting. Um, in the same way that you know when you're it's, it's you find this in writing or you know when you um, when you have something that's, that's just really great, but it's you know knowing it's you've got too much good stuff and so some of it has to go. So. Yeah, you can't be you can't be too precious about. No. About any particular, yeah, yeah. No. You know, we talk about the great dramatic films a lot, mm-hmm. uh, but I would think cutting comedy would be particularly challenging. Uh, certainly, and 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 you know, it's I certainly the, the book. You know, if there's one thing I wish I'd done more of is maybe speaking to more editors who are kind of adept at at uh, at cutting comedy. You know, I mean, one of them that I did speak to is Richie Marks, who's you know who's James L. Brooks's regular editor, and mm-hmm. so. He has had um, quite a bit of experience in that, and um, and also, but you know, and also Michael Kahn, who very you know, here is that the uh, Spielberg's editor had his career because he started working on Hogan Heroes, Hogan Heroes, sorry, um, which you know seems like such an unlikely start, but you know that's where he learned you know learned the ropes and. Um, and from there, he, you know, he, Michael Connell was telling me about, you know, he learned all the, the kind of the, 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 the rules about, you know, not letting a joke, you know, play too long, kind of not cutting when you cut to the reaction for the laugh, when you, you know, and kind of having that sort of very snappy, snappy timing and rhythm so that a joke, you know, kills instead of dies, I guess. So mm-hmm. um, it's a tricky thing. I do wish I'd spoken to more, but, um, but I, you know, editing, I mean, uh, not editing, comedy as always is underrated. And I think it's a, uh, you know, it's a very, because it's a very difficult thing to pull off. Well, those, those films you mentioned, I mean, just the, the Michael Kahn Spielberg collaborations there, there, sure. there, there's lots of humor in those. Very true. Yeah. Uh, it's great. No, I mean, it's, uh, uh, even, even the action films, they're all, you know, like a, I mean, like Raiders of the Lost Ark is kind of a, a comedy at heart, you know? So, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. The, the last question for you, and the, this is, sure. This is something very interesting to me. Uh, you being a critic yourself, sure. do you find after assembling this book, after writing this book, that you're watching movies differently somehow now? <laughs> uh, <laughs> certainly so. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I, I still think I, I watch movies more or less the way I I I, I always have, um, but every so often, um, and sometimes I have to say when I'm maybe when I'm not so into a movie, I, I kind of you know your mind kind of gets you start you starts to wander and you you have to kind of find the way back into it. So I'll say like let's pay attention to the editing, you know, a little bit. So um, that's certainly that's you know something I look for more. Um, I do think though that to kind of to appreciate this art fully, it often it, it's it is a very difficult thing to appreciate because you can't entirely appreciate it unless you know you have some sense of what they were working with before. And, of course, that's kind of impossible knowledge to have unless you go through, you know, you're watching on DVD and you watch deleted scenes, you watch extras, you know. But until you know know the full picture, and obviously it's a good thing that you don't because that would perhaps wreck your enjoyment of the movie, it's really hard to appreciate, you know, what an editor has done. And that kind of, again, brings us back to this idea of the editor as sort of the invisible artist in a way you know yeah. it's uh um so it, it's it's uh i certainly do watch watch films now with an eye more towards you know kind of the 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 um the timing of things and you know the the beats you know and, and sort of a and kind of how maybe, maybe how elegantly or how kind of efficiently a movie proceeds from one scene to the next but uh, mm-hmm. um it's uh yeah no it's uh, it's all part of just you know I think the great thing about this this uh, film craft series is its its purpose is just to kind of, um, in a very you know layperson friendly way, get you to watch movies just a little bit more closely. 